Brilliant.org is a great way to learn computer science and data science via concise bite-sized lessons. There's thousands of topics in each of these subjects from statistics to probability to artificial intelligence to programming with new lessons being added every month. The data science courses, for instance, have been great in building my intuition with a hands-on approach that's quite effective even on a busy schedule. The lessons on Brilliant are an excellent tool for lifelong learning in a fun and interactive way. And to try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash faculty of con or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 of you that sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Greetings students and welcome back to another video on real analysis. In this lesson, we're going to introduce functions and define the various kinds of functions. And as a prelude to functions, we'll first talk about the idea of a Cartesian product. Suppose I had two non-empty sets, a and b, with elements small a and small b respectively. The Cartesian product a cross b of a and b is the set of all ordered pairs of the elements of the sets a and b. For example, if I had the set A comprised of the elements 1 and 2, and I had a set D comprised of the elements Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then the Cartesian product of A and B consists of all ordered pair combinations between the elements of set A and those of set B. So in this example, the Cartesian product would be A cross B equals 1 comma Monday, 1 comma Tuesday, 1 comma Wednesday, and then 2 comma Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So basically, a Cartesian product between two sets is the set of all possible pair combinations between the elements of those two sets, with the restriction that an element from one set cannot be paired with an element from the same set. So in this example, I can't have 1, 2 or Monday, Tuesday as an ordered pair. The ordered pair has to consist of elements from different sets. The idea of Cartesian products leads us to the definition of a function. Again, suppose we have the sets a and b with elements small a and small b. A function from a to b is a set f of ordered pairs in the Cartesian product a cross b, such that for every element in a, there is a unique element in b. So a function f from a to b, by the way, is denoted by f a to b like so. Because there's a unique b for every element in a, we can say that if the ordered pair a comma b belongs to the function set f, and if the ordered pair a comma b prime also belongs to the function set f, then b and b prime must be equal. If they're not equal, the set f is not a function. You must have a unique b for every a. You cannot have multiple b's for the same a. This is essential. So if we look at the entire set a cross b, that is clearly not a function. For the same element in a, like 1 for instance, you have multiple corresponding elements in b. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. However, if we were to consider the subset f1 of a cross b that look like this, where 1 and 2 are both mapped to single unique elements in b, then this f1 would qualify as a function. I could even replace the Tuesday with Monday, and f1 would still be a function because each element in a is being mapped to a single element in b, not multiple elements in b. It's a special type of function called a many-to-one function, because both 1 and 2 are mapping to Monday, but it's a function nonetheless. However, if I had a subset f2 of a cross b that looked like this, where 2 is being mapped to multiple elements in b, in this case Tuesday and Wednesday, that would not be a function. The element 2 in a is not being mapped to a unique element in b, it's being mapped to two elements in b, so which disqualifies f2 from being a function. Now, if the function f is from the set a to the set b, then the set a or the set of first elements in the ordered pairs is called the domain of f, denoted by d of f. On the other hand, the set of the second elements is called the range of f. So in our example of the function f1, the domain of f1 is just the set a, which is 1 and 2. The range of f1 is the set of second elements in f1, so just Monday and Tuesday. So while the domain of a function is always the entirety of the first set a, the range of that function is a subset of the second set b. It can either equal the entire set b or it can just be a subset. However, it's not necessarily equal to the entire set b as illustrated by our example function f1. Hopefully this hammers home the idea of a function. In the rest of the video, I'm going to talk about different types of functions. We'll begin by discussing direct and inverse images. 
Suppose I have a function f from the set a to the set b, whose domain is d of f, which is just a as explained above, and whose range is a subset of b. If I had a subset of a now that I'll call e, the direct image of e under the function f is just f of e. In addition, if h is a subset of b, then the inverse image of h under f is the subset f inverse h of a defined as the following. Basically, it consists of all the values of x in the domain of h, such that f of x is contained in the set h. This might seem like a lot of abstract terminology, so let me use an example to explain further. Say I had a function that mapped the real numbers to the real numbers and was defined by the rule f of x equals x squared. If I pick the subset e to be all the values of x between 0 and 2, then the direct image of e would be all the values of f of e between 0 and 4. This makes sense. 0 squared is 0 and 2 squared is 4. However, the inverse image of the set h, which consists of all f of x between 0 and 4, is another set g that consists of values of x between negative 2 and 2. Negative 2 squared can be 4 just as 2 squared can be 4. When you take the square root and you're dealing with real numbers, you have to account for both positive and negative roots. As a result, the set g and set e are not the same. That's the key here. The inverse of the direct image of e is not the set e necessarily. The next concepts we'll discuss are injective, surjective, and bijective functions. An injective function from a to b is basically a one-to-one -one function. This means that whenever we have any two unequal inputs to the function, their outputs must also be unequal. By the definition of a function, every element in the domain a corresponds to only one element in the range, and additionally, because this function is injective, every element in the range of the function corresponds to exactly one element in the domain. So a function like x squared is not injective. It's many to one because the square of both negative one and one is one. So the element one squared in the range is mapped to two elements in the domain, one and negative one. In contrast, a function like f of x equals x is injective. Every element in the range corresponds to exactly one element in the domain. So if we want to prove that a function is injective, we have to establish that when f of x1 and f of x2 are equal, x1 and x2 must be equal for every x1 and x2 in the domain of f. If x1 and x2 are not equal, the function is not injective. Let's talk about surjective functions. A function f from the sets a to b is surjective if its range is equal to the entire set b. This is also called an onto function. Let's look at our example x squared again. If f is a function mapping a real number to another real number, then the function x squared is not onto. No matter what real number we give it, we only get a positive or zero real number. No real number squared ever gives you a negative value, so the range here is not equal to the specified output set r. Instead, it's r minus the negative real numbers r to the negative. On the other hand, a function f of x equals x is onto because if we give f of x any real number, we can get any real number in return. The range isn't restricted like it is with x squared. If we want to prove that a function from a set A to a set B is surjective, we need to demonstrate that for every element in the set B, there is an element in the set A which maps to B via the function f. So in this case, x squared is not surjective, because if I take an element in the set B, which is real numbers, if I take a negative number, like say negative one, for instance, then I will not be able to find an element in the domain that maps to negative one through the function f of x equals x squared, because it's not possible within the real numbers, at least, to square a number and end up with negative one. Lastly, we'll mention bijective functions. A bijective function is one that is both surjective and injective. So in the examples I gave, f of x equals x is clearly a bijective function, while x squared is clearly not a bijective function. Proving that a function is bijective should be self-explanatory. Just prove that it's both injective and surjective. Finally, I'll finish this video by talking about inverse functions and composite functions, starting with inverse functions. Let's again take our two example sets a and b, whose Cartesian product is given by the following. As defined earlier, a function f0 from a to b would then be a valid subset of the Cartesian product a cross b, where every element from a is mapped to a unique element in b. 
So for example, something like this would be a valid function. I invite you to show yourself that f0 is bijective. It is both injective and surjective. Why? Well, let's take a look. The range of f0 is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which is exactly equal to b. And since the range of f0 is the entire set b, f0 is surjective. It's also injective because every element in the range of f0 corresponds to only one element in the domain of f0. sub Monday only corresponds to 1, Tuesday only to 2, Wednesday only to 3, so therefore f0 is injective. And since it's both injective and surjective, it is automatically bijective. Now for this bijective function f sub 0, what happens when we switch the order of the elements in the ordered pairs? Well, we get an inverse function f0 inverse, which now maps elements in b back to elements in a. It's the inverse or reverse of f0. Now, by the way, f0 and f0 I'm using interchangeably here, so they both mean the same thing. Now that I've given an example of what an inverse function looks like, let's define inverse functions. An inverse function f inverse of a bijective function f is the set of ordered pairs b comma a in the Cartesian product b cross a such that the ordered pair a comma b was an element of the original function f. So basically, we're mapping elements in B back to A and getting reverse ordered pairs as elements of the inverse function. Note that bijective is very clearly specified in this definition. If I had a function that was not bijective, it would not have a valid inverse. The last topic I'll go over in this video is defining the composition of two functions. Suppose f is a function mapping elements in set A to elements in set B and g is a function mapping elements in set c to elements in set d. As long as the range of f is contained within the domain of g, as long as it's a subset of the domain of g, we can write the composition of two functions as a composite function g of f of x, which maps elements in set a directly to set d. Here's a quick example. Suppose I had a function f of x equal to x squared and a function g of x equal to x cubed. Both of these functions mapped real numbers to real numbers, so the range of f, which is the positive real numbers, is obviously contained within the domain of g. The composite function g of f of x is then just g of x squared, if we substitute f of x, which is x squared whole cubed, which is just x to the power 6. Anyway, hopefully this video gives you a good overview of functions and the various types of functions we'll encounter in real analysis. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.